Hello and welcome to Commander Central episode 27. Today we're going to be talking about frequently made play mistakes in Commander and how to correct those. Um, and by we, I mean Chris and Max mostly. I don't make a lot of mistakes, so I'll just be listening. I'm walking. Screw this. <laughs> Flip the table. I'm done. Trying to understand what it's like for the common man to play an imperfect game. So you guys are talking about that. I'll be listening. We're also going to cover social media. <laughs> 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 I, couldn't, I couldn't maintain it. Um, games we played and the usual stuff we do here on Commander Central. I'm Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Chris. So how's it going this evening, gentlemen? It's late. I want to go to bed. Me too. I just played volleyball for an hour, so I'm exhausted. I had. Vacation. I won't tell you what I did an hour ago. We'll keep that as <laughs> just personal information. We have to keep this repeat a, this, this from a last <laughs> night. <laughs> Family friendly podcast here for all yep, our listeners. We're PG ish, <laughs> <laughs> right? R- roughly. Um, I was on vacation last week, so I'm feeling pretty rested and, and relaxed. Um, I bought a collection in Florida because <laughs> because why not when I'm on vacation? What else do you do on vacation? Exactly. Um, so I bought it from a guy in Everglades City, which is in the Everglades. And I didn't really think this thing through. Um, but he, I found him on, on Facebook, and he was selling a collection in like a local group. So we agreed to meet, and we were going to go to Everglades City anyway to do like an airboat tour. So we made an agreement to meet, and he wanted $20 for this collection. He sent me a picture of, and it was like a two-row long box. So that's 1,200. 1,200 cards, okay. 600? 2,000? Because um, usually one row is like 1,000? Yeah, but they're shorter than a 5,000. They're shorter than a 5K box. So, so I, think they're, I, think, I think they're like 1,200. So I, anyway, I agreed to, to, to meet and look at it. And we, we met, and he was very nice. We met in like a parking lot of a bar. Um, and but I looked at the cards, and I'm like, oh, this is Florida, and this is the Everglades. <laughs> <laughs> and they were all just like, not just warped, like waved. Like, I mean, it's Florida. It's the swamp. I mean, yep. like it was th- this wrecked, like un, like not sleeve playable. Almost any of them. Oh no! So I, I flipped through it. The ones that weren't stuck together, because most of them were stuck together. Oh yikes! Um, and there was you could like see there was mold on the side, even a little bit of the of the long box. I'm like, I'll give you ten dollars because you came down here, but like I can't give you. I mean, like twenty. There's no way I salvage twenty bucks out of this. So he took it. He's like, yeah, I, I just want them. I don't need to keep them. He's like, I. He said he threw away. Three five thousand count boxes of oh. of older stuff. He said, and this was all almost all Mirrodin first Mirrodin set. Oh, so who knows what he had to junk that was in, like said this was a salvageable stuff. So I I look I, I flipped through it and went through it all in the cards that were actually like not totally ruined. There was one um, Aether Vial, and there was a handful like maybe a dozen artifact lands, um, and a couple small things like that. So. Had they been in great shape, it would have been definitely worth it. Um, that I don't think the Aether Vial was even sleeve playable. So I I basically took anything worth anything and sent it to Card Kingdom to see what they're going to give me. Um, if I get my 10 <laughs> like I'm not sure I'm going to get my $10 back <laughs> with shipping. <laughs> but we'll see. Um, so anyway, um, if you're on vacation in Arizona, look for collections. If you're on vacation near the swamp, be forewarned the collections oh. you look at might just be in terrible, terrible condition. Yikes. Yeah. Sounds wonderful. Yeah. Yes, I junked the rest. I literally pickled those cards and threw the rest in the dumpster. <laughs> Didn't they were even all bother st- looking through them? Well, as much as I could. But like, okay. so many of them were stuck together, and, and it was clearly that there wasn't anything. It was all mirrored in. Um, so there, I was sure there was like wasn't a mox in there that I could have salvaged. So anything that was not moldy or stuck together, probably I like two out. swords of fire and may, ice may, in there. I did, there was no swords I didn't see, and no, they were all stuck together, <laughs> like <laughs> right, the middle yeah, of maybe. a chunk, <laughs> just a wet sponge of a yeah. Uh, so uh, any good games this week? I played one. You played Max played one with my with my with deck. Your recce deck. So how did you like playing it? I I enjoyed playing it. it Have you played it before? Once, and I got. Okay. Terribly land screwed. That's in right. It. In this game, you didn't. You you fired off. I fired off pretty quick. Someone had to destroy Recky on turn the minute I played him. Who was that? You, I that did, was I you. Did, I did that. <laughs> but you still like yeah. blew up. The only reason, because I, I had drawn a bunch of cards at one point, I'd rift, and I yeah. saved myself with a rift. You drew half your deck, and yeah. I I had lethal on board, and you're like, yeah, I've rift. I'm like, okay, good game. I had a um uh. What's the the locust enchantment that draws you uh, swarm intelligence out? Oh, jeez! And I had flipped the 
amulet that copies a spell too. So I was, I mean, I was, everything I cast, all those cantrips around me, two cards around me, four. At one point, I think I copied a recurring insight and then copied again. So I drew like 22. I mean, I was, so I just hit Rift eventually, and then when Max swung in, I was able to pop it. But had I not been playing blue, you would have won that game. Right. Um, I had a couple good games I want to mention here. Um, I had a, I put a recce game, um, and my opponent <coughs> did a turn one soul ring and played a turn two memory erosion. And for those that don't know, memory erosion is an enchantment. It's one blue blue. Uh, whenever an opponent casts a spell, that player puts the top two cards of his or her library into their graveyard. So it's a mill spell. Yep. Um, so I actually paused. I'm like, okay, well, I can maybe draw some of the deals with that, but I'm just going to play. I'm going to pretend that isn't there and just like just go. Because um, everybody else was like at that point kind of playing conservatively because they didn't want to get milled because no one really had recursion decks. Why don't those cards ever come down on turn two when I'm playing my Alesha deck? Right, exactly, exactly. Kill me. Cause it, right? Because they were definitely not. And I have zero recursion in that Reiki deck. So I just like went full bore. Um, and I wound up winning the game. I literally was, I had literally no cards left in the library. I drew, oh. my, I drew the turn I drew the last card, I killed the last person. I killed the guy with memory erosion. That was, <laughs> that was the end of the game. That is too perfect. But I was just like doing like the usual recce stuff where I'm like playing a creature, drawing a card, playing a creature, drawing a card, playing a creature, and just like milling like a madman. And at one point there was a, the same player played a Dreamborn Muse, which is the blue muse, um, like the Seedborn Muse where you untap or the Windborn Muse. Okay. The blue one mills you during your upkeep for the number of cards in hand. He played it and I had 14 in hand or something. So it comes to my turn and I mill, oh. I mill 14 and that stayed in play for like three turns too. So I just churned through my library, but I'm like, yeah, you know, YOLO, let's see yeah, what happens. <laughs> right? Dropping big beaters constantly gets yep. through all that. Um, and I, I the, another game I played against the same players, I played my DeGiro deck, and everyone laughed because it's Modern White Planeswalkers. <laughs> <laughs> doof. But I got to win the game with, um, in, in, in a one-turn swing, I had six... Elspeth soldiers out. Uh, Elspeth son's champion, so I had made two rounds of soldiers, and I had six in play, and I already had a Gideon emblem off Ally Zendikar, so they were two twos. Yep. And it came back around to me in my turn, and I played um, a Myria Angel. So when you play a plane, you return a permanent card from your graveyard to play. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so I played a plane, brought Gideon back, made an emblem and killed him, Played Wayfarer's Bobble, cracked it to go get a plane in the play tapped to bring Gideon back, killed him <laughs> for another emblem. So I've got three Gideon emblems at this point, and then cast um, a Johnny Mentor of Heroes, which let me get Elspeth up to into alter. into all range and cracked her for another emblem. So I took those like two those six two two soldiers became six six soldiers with flying and vigilance. I think vigilance. And I was able to kill the last two people left because of like planeswalkers trying to get into the final light. Ajani steadfast. Steadfast, yeah, steadfast. I was gonna say, how'd men, you play a green men, white Ajani? Mentors green white, steadfast. Who puts a plus one counter on everything and a uh, loyalty counter on planeswalkers. And a loyalty counter on planeswalkers. So that got Elspeth up into range so I could alter her. Yep. So that felt awesome. good being able to do shenanigans that like everyone's like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> oh. So. Anyone brewing any new decks that they want to talk about? Because I think Max might have one he's thinking of doing. I am thinking about a new deck. Ooh. So what do you got going? I'm going to build Maelstrom Wanderer. Cheating. So I'm just going to play every card that lets you cheat something into play. Okay. I don't, I don't know what like the win con is yet, but <laughs> it's going to be fun. You're on the three. See, now you're con you're converted to liking three color decks. After yeah. It's, a, it's an addiction. It is. How about you, Chris? Got anything brewing right now? You've been kind of like low key commander lately. You've been doing a lot of one v one and a lot so of modern. much, so many tournaments. I have another three tournaments starting next month again too. So, are you excited about the um, unbans? In oh, I am psyched about that. Because you're playing, you're going to actually use Jace, right? You're going to no, play. I'm going to use Bloodbraid Elf. Okay, oh, that's right, because you're playing Jund. Yep. Interesting. So, is it going to be good for the format? Do you think? I think it'll be powerful for the format. Actually, I don't think it's going to hurt it at all. Okay. I'm actually more scared of Blood Braid than I am of Jace. Especially around our area, I don't think a lot of people are good enough players to realize that I Jace just, just say, can't get jammed in any deck. J Jace is also a much more skill-intensive card to use. Yep. Than he was, I actually read an article from Brian Brondouin today 
that uh, he pretty much summarized everything I was thinking that uh, Jace is a build around card. When you build a deck, you have to build around him. You can't just jam him into any type of build deck. Right. And you have to know what you're doing with him, too. Yeah. And if you do, it's, it's a ridiculously strong card. The whole it's broken, but, in my opinion. If you get it, you know, once right. it's online, it's, there's no stopping it. But I, I noticed right now the big thing on all my feeds is the modern miracles now that Jace is unbanned. I'm like, I've been, yeah, I've been oh, seeing a lot of that. Oh, that's going to be boring to play against. Because even in Treat the Angels, somebody was talking about that it took a little spike because of that. Like, all right, well, let's see what, let's see what happens. Well, yeah, I think Terminus. I bet you Terminus is going to go up in price, get, too. Yeah, that'll bounce back. So... All right. Anything on social media this week? Yeah, we heard from a nice gentleman named Anthony on Twitter. Uh, his Twitter handle is at Tony underscore on underscore tilt. Uh, he just wanted to inform us that uh, the last episode that he listened to, which would have been our monocolored deck episode, things were quiet. And that was with his volume turned all the way up. Um, I'm not sure what source he was coming from from listening. Because I know when I listen to it on YouTube, it sounds really loud to me. So... If you have volume issues with us, let us know, particularly any specifics. Like I was listening on SoundCloud. Or I was listening on, on, on my the, Apple device right. or the Libsyn post on Facebook. You yeah, know, just let us, us know, what, know that. what episode you're listening to, what format, what you were wearing, that, those kind of things. Just keep us fully informed as to every every variable and we can kind of figure it out. Although Max thought that was an episode in particular where we had a few volume issues. We, we did. I noticed a bunch of times where all three of us moved away from our mic quite a bit. So all right. we've made some adjustments on the equipment going forward. So hopefully things we, are We have our mics, mics now strapped to our heads so we can't move, can't move away. It's like, it's like a the, jaw, not jaws. <laughs> like, like from uh, Saw. Thank, there you go. Like a torture device from Saw. So that should solve that problem. So, yeah, um, for everyone else, uh, you know, you can reach us anytime on uh, any of our social media. Uh, Twitter, you can find us at CMDR Central. Facebook, search us, Commander Central. YouTube, search us, CMDR Central, or online at cmdrcentral.com. And, of course, we are on Patreon by searching CMDR Central. Um, So if you want to donate to the show, we would greatly appreciate it. It helps us cover some of our costs and do some more exciting things in the future. For sure. We also did have a user complaint on YouTube about... Um, the amount of Trump jokes that I was making, um, I I but I, I had been thinking like I'm not gonna not do it just because one person's feelings were hurt, but it's such it's like such a low hanging fruit, and it's an, I'm just not gonna do it for a while because I'm just it's let the waters calm. I might yes, and it's we'll you know, chum them up again later. <laughs> right, <Yep. laughs> uh, think of something else funny to reference. So that's we're not gonna be doing that if that makes the, if that is going to interest you to not hear Trump jokes and you can go watch literally any late night comedian make much better ones than I'm going to make. <laughs> okay, let's talk about common mistakes, play mistakes we see in Commander. We're not going to get into like deck building mistakes. We want to talk about specific play mistakes and we're going to try to really really focus on examples from games that we've seen and talk about how to fix those mistakes. Um kind of get into real specifics here. So does anyone have one they want to bring up first? I have my, my number one on my list is tapping your mana wrong. It's like the number one play mistake I usually see when I'm playing with people. So like they, they are playing a three-color deck and they need four black sources and they tap three of them to use four colorless mana or something. Yep. See, my my big uh, like example on this is say you have Utter End in hand, which requires black and white. You ended up leaving, you know, doing something else, and you left up your red white source, and then a like single white source or something. Mm-hmm. Instead of tapping your red white source, leaving up white, and then a black white source plus whatever else to be able to cast it. Um, yeah, I I do it too. I like that one. Do I see it? I'm guilty of doing it. I do it at least once a week, and it's almost always because you're rushing. Yep. Like it's almost always, that's a problem you can almost always solve by taking two extra seconds before casting each spell and going, <gasps> okay, take a breath. What I think it, what, what mana do I need for the next spell I'm going to cast? Yeah, what I think it might be contributed from is you're in a four player game. And I know when I play just like a tournament base or whatever, you know, you're on a set clock, you know, there's, you can't slow play or anything. With four players, you have a limited amount of time to play. So a lot of people play faster so you can get in as much games as possible. Yeah. That's one thing I, I I like. Not that Chromatic Lantern isn't a great card, because it is. I mean, it's a yep. really gr- really good card. But I actually love c- 
like when I play Chromatic Lantern in a deck, I actually kind of do a oh now I cannot care. Yep, <laughs> like pretty like much. It, it like no, now life's easy. I just not have to. I don't have to care about mana at all. I just it's all magically the right colors. That's how I feel about Riftstone Portal in Dramoka. Yeah, once it hits sure. my graveyard, I don't care the rest of the game. All right. Uh, what else? What's another one? I f- forget to read cards <laughs> on the battlefield. <laughs> no. Well, it's easy to do, though, when you're playing, again, four players, and you're not just talking standard. You're talking 20,000 possible permutations. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I think I mentioned this on one of our most more recent shows, but I was playing a game against some people at the shop, and it came down to me and another player, and I asked your command to kill all creatures because I didn't. Because I then like ghost weighed to save all my stuff, and he had a blood artist and a Zulaport cutthroat out, and I was at four life, and I died. So you, you're essentially your austere command killed you because yes, you weren't paying. Yes, because I didn't read, and I I only did it just to pretty much ensure a win, and instead <laughs> I killed myself. I have done that myself plenty of times. Here's one I have, and I'm probably gonna th- this will this is specifically something that happened this week. I mean, I would say it's not understanding what other people's decks can or can't do based on the colors they have. So, okay, you know, if you someone's playing mono black, you should know well, they probably can't deal with my enchantment. So, in this particular case, I was playing mono green, and I had an Omnath, um, original Omnath, mono green with like thirty-two mana in the mana pool. So he was a thirty-two, thirty-two, and I was swinging into a blue player who had no blockers, and this was going to kill him. I knew he had two spells in hand, because he brought one back with Baby Jace, and he brought one. He had one with a factor of fiction. He had a Mystic Confluence and an Evacuation. Two things you really don't want to see, swinging with a 32-32 on Correct. That. But I had to like deal with him that turn or something bad. I can't remember what it was, but like he had to be the person I killed. Yep. So I swung at him, and I knew he was going to do one of the two things. And he cast... Mystic Confluence to bounce a creature and to draw two cards. Now, here's this. Here's where I'm talking about what knowing what cards can or can't do. There's nothing I can do to evacuation. No. There's a zero responses that exist because I, I I look to verify this. There's zero response. Green has no counter target blue spell. Um, there's a guttural response, which is green which red, is green red, but yep. it commander and it's a hybrid. So like yep. if I was playing. Modern, I could use it, but you can't, it's not legal in Commander. So there's zero ways to deal with that at instant speed for me to stop that evacuation. However, Mystic Confluence targets. Yep. And I had a heroic intervention in hand. So I dropped heroic intervention and he died to the Omnath coming through. So I, and I knew like when I swung to it wasn't just like, um, it wasn't, I was like, there's a coin flip chance he picks the wrong one, and I have to kill him, so I'm, let's just see what happens. I think that was just a misplay in general by the blue player. In my personal opinion, I would have played Evacuation, getting rid of all the creatures on the board. Everyone else, right. is, he, and he wanted the two draws, so he did bounce, draw, draw. You still would have had Mystic Confluence to back up for Counterspell next turn once that big nasty comes back, and you're just like, nope, and yep. draw. Yeah, I mean, there was a, there was multiple lines. The, just the one that I kept think, thing I just kept thinking was, there's no, like, he, he guarantees he survives the turn of evacuation. And there's, it's not just heroic intervention. There's a bunch of green spells that could have dealt with the target. You know, green has a lot of hexproof instant spells. You bet. Yes. Uh, Blinding Fog, Patra's Mark, there's Ranger's Guile, there's Sheltering Word, there's Woodcutter's Grift. I looked up, you know, just a few of them, and there, and there was more than that. There's Avoid Fate. Um, of the vast wood, yeah. blossoming defense. Yep. There's, there's, there's a couple ones that give protection from blue at instant speed. Yep. Now, no one run like they're not in anyone's deck, but like definitely heroic interventions in like seven thousand decks in EDH rack. That's a fantastic card. Um, and even if he didn't like, because actually when it, when it happened, um, there was a friend of ours, Adam Darby, in the game, and Adam said as it as he sw- as he cast Mystic Confluence, and I went over and took two mana count took two mana off of Omnath, Adam's like, he's got a heroic intervention. Adam, <laughs> 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 yes, I did. Um, so yeah, that's an example. Now you like to actually pause and go, okay, is there any way he can respond to these two cards? That's prob- That's kind of high level play. But it's not that, I mean, maybe you should be doing that. Maybe you should. If you have, to, if you have a choice to make, maybe you need to stop and think, 
Is one of these going to guarantee me survival and one of them not? Is it worth two cards? I don't think it's worth two cards. Take the chance that someone's got a heroic intervention in hand. True. So yeah. that's I mean, one. That would, that would be a, a, one that's it's relatively easy to fix. You can't know everything, but you can at least, I mean, that's something you probably should know. Green can do hexproof at instant speed. Yep. All right. What else? My next one would be thinking your turn out ahead of time. So whether it's while your opponents are taking their turn, you can plan, okay, I'm going to yep. do A, B, and C. And then if something big happens, your plans change a little. But every now and then I forget to do that, and I'll get to my turn and do B, C, A, and screw up the whole sequence of spells, and I screw up my entire turn. So you come up with this, with this plan, and then when your turn comes... You don't execute it in the correct sequence that you had because you're so ready to like do all these right. things. I ab I absolutely am guilty of Th- that. This was a big one for me where I when I used to run Amiria Angel and Dramoka and getting the landfall triggers right, I'd always forget I would play Amiria I would always play the land first and then cast the creature. Sure. And Chris just hit his head really hard. <laughs> uh, from tournament play I've learned land drops usually are not played right away. You play stuff in your hand first, unless you absolutely need the mana from that land. Particularly right. in tournament play, I oftentimes see the, the lands almost always played in the second main phase. Yep. yep. Very frequently. Commander players are almost always trying to get out in that first main phase so they can do a bunch of stuff. Which pretty is I think really people necessary. forget there's two main phases. Yeah, <laughs> I really it, do. For sure. I'm going to throw everybody off next week, and my first turn, I'm like, okay, second main phase, and start playing stuff. Right. <laughs> Chris, any more specifics from you? Um, going off of maxes or another instant? Another instant. Uh, either, either or. Okay. Well, I'll come. I'll bring up another one. Um, playing out of priority order, which bothers the daylights <laughs> well, again, out of that's me. A, that's a right as a as a tournament player for sure. Yeah. Where? Okay. See if I can come up with a good instance of this. Let's say I jam, uh, Trastodon onto the field. We'll we'll go with Trastodon. Now you go around in a circle. Well, let's say you're player one, player two should be able to respond next, and then player three, then player four. Yep. 90% of the time, I see player four go, okay, I'm going to respond to that. And you're just like, really? I, I didn't even care about you. I was going after someone else hoping to draw their stuff, and now you're going to take care of it. I, I typically see that. I agree. That bugs me really bad. And I typically see that because that player four is probably the only blue player on your table. Yeah. So they're assuming player two and three can't do anything to it. So I kind of get that because Commander is a casual format, so you can kind of bend that rule a little. But when players two, three, and four are playing blue and X, you should really pause and let everybody take priority. Yes, especially as player four, you should, can sit there and go, okay, well, I can save my resources for later instances. You bet. And see if player two is going to take care of it or player three is going to take care of it. And then if I need to, I will stop it from occurring. Yep. But there's no reason to expend your resources unless you absolutely It's have all to. about just management of the game so you have a way of winning. If you're blowing all your resources out of priority turn, you just set up the players before you who could have taken care of it. Now they can take care of whatever you decide to do. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I'm relatively conscious of that. I try not to jump ahead too much to do it, and I think I do a pretty decent job. But I absolutely see that one happen a lot. Yeah. And the, I've also seen people be like, wait, no, stop. You're out of order. Let me take my turn, and I'm going to counterspell it. I'm like, why? Why would you <laughs> just let the person make the mistake? Maybe, now, see, maybe point it out afterwards, but like, let them use their resources. I have been first. guilty of doing that, but usually when it happens, it's because I know that it's coming at me. Like, I am the threat. And, sure. You know, usually it's one of those they play the card and they look right at you. Like, <laughs> what are you going to do about <laughs> it? <laughs> yeah, no, that one is um, is one that I see plenty, and yeah, it's an issue. Um, I've got another one here I'm going to point out, um, and that would be playing multiplayer like it's 1v1. And you are, we, are we talking tunnel vision here? I'm talking mostly overextending. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, I'm totally guilty of this. Or, or playing over- <laughs> We all are. I've seen us all do it at one point sure. in time. Or playing overly aggressive. Okay. Um, and where I've really seen it recently, I first of all, I used to do it a lot because when I first started playing Commander, I was playing almost exclusively 1v1 for probably like two or three months before we went to the shop and started playing with people. So I had one, a friend I was playing with, and, well, when you're playing 1v1, there's almost no such thing as being overly aggressive. Nope. That, that person's going to board wipe when it's in their best benefit to board wipe, and whether you take three turns to get there or five or seven, 
they're still going to board wipe once you hit that maximum capacity of creatures or whatever. In a four-player game, that's a whole different thing because you have different people doing different things and and you have three times as many board wipes and you have, there's just a lot more variables. So I had to really train myself to hold back and like think about why I'm going all in versus just going all in. Mm-hmm. And and right now we have two players who we've mentioned, my, my neighbor and his friend, who are both relatively new, and they've really gotten to be pretty well, sharp. Don't even players. don't even say no. new anymore. <laughs> no, they're <laughs> right. they're very good players, but they play against each other a lot. Okay. So when so when we get to a four player game at the shop, when they've just been playing two nights at work or something against each other, and then playing like kind of Saturday together, and they come to the shop and play a four player game, they both then tend to want to just go full bore as fast as they can, and wind up setting themselves back because they're so used to playing like it's a 1v1 game. I understand that completely. That's actually something that I did have on my list was very similar to that. And I remember when I was first playing at the shop with you guys, or some of the first players I was playing multiplayer games with, after like three or four weeks of noticing that, I said, okay, when I play first game next week, I'm going to intentionally not cast my commander until turn six. Or I'm going to intentionally not cast my first creature spell until turn four or something. Just to make sure I held back and like to train myself to even if it was a bad idea I just wanted to like do it to then get myself in the mindset that you don't have to always just go as hard and as fast as you can so that is one I see frequently and that's should be easy to correct but you also have to know you're doing it I think a lot of times players aren't aware they're doing that right I totally agree with that and it's hard when you go from a, a 1v1 environment like playing at your house with your buddy to a shop environment because you're only used to his two or three decks, and he's used yeah. to your two and three decks. And, and you're used to his play style. Right. And then now you're in an environment where there are 20,000 cards that, that could be shown to you in a night. And you could be sitting at like six different pods with, with different people every single game, which happens. Right. So. Uh, you should invite those guys down when uh, good old buddy Lee Henderson, L2 Judge from Minnesota. If anyone's ever interested to get a hold of him, he loves to play Commander. But when he plays, since he is a judge... He is a rule shark, is he? <laughs> and he knows the rules in and out, and he will catch things, like when he'll play something and be like, oh, yeah, and then this is this and this and on this stack and this, and you're just like, yeah, that's how it all works. Yes, yeah. I know. <laughs> you ask him to draw you a picture next time. <laughs> I should. <laughs> I want a flow chart of what you're doing here. <laughs> all right, Max, what do you got for us? This might not be a play mistake, but it's something that I kind of live by is knowing your deck. No, that's absolutely a play mistake. Um, because this situation happened this week. Uh, we had a player in one of our pods playing a Marin deck, and he played, uh, what's the one that lets you put three creature cards into your graveyard? Uh, not in Tomb. Uh, buried Alive. Buried Alive, yep. yep. He played Buried Alive, and Marin had like seven or eight counters on him. And so I'm sitting there going, okay, what big baddie is he going to... And he also had 12 land or 14 land yeah. to play. And I'm sitting there going, okay, he's going to go grab Shieldred or Crater Hoof or something. And he grabbed, like, Caustic Caterpillar. He grabbed all these little tiny... Wood Elves, I think. Utility creatures, essentially. Like, a Wood Elves, a Caustic Caterpillar. Where Marin's at seven counters. That's That should be the top of your curve in that deck. Go go get your win con. So I think if you know your deck, you know every situation what you should be looking for. Especially when you have three options to go get. Right. See, I wonder if that situation leans more towards a win more strategy. Maybe with who they play with, you almost need to be guaranteed win type of deal. And maybe he's also like a little bit intimidated, so he's playing super careful because he doesn't know everybody and it's he's new to the shop, really maybe. speaking. Yeah. So oh, there's I like a lot to make of things enemies. that could have been. Yeah. But a lot of those 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 are all play mistakes in mm-hmm. a way. I mean yep. But I mean, if you don't know your deck, you delay the game because you end up looking for answers if you're playing tutors you're sitting there going i might have a way to get out of this situation where you're probably locked down where if you know your deck you know oh yep i've used my two board wipes my three counter spells i have nothing left i someone else has to fix this or we're, we're all done yep well i would say in that situation too um marin is a complicated deck for a new player to play there's a lot of decision making that has to go on I would just say if you're a new player, you probably shouldn't be playing Marin. He, I think he also has a, is an, it a Nala, Nala or, a, or a Kest deck, which is also not an easy deck to play, or at least to play well. I think you that that's 
and he and he doesn't play either of them. He plays either of them like you would expect someone who's new to the game to play, yep. which is perfectly fine. But uh, right, that that seems like an unnecessary challenge for a new player to jump in to decks that require that much understanding of the cards. Well, I'll, I'll even say I'm you know playing for such a long time. I'm I come at fault with that when I play my Alesha deck. You have a million different options to throw into your graveyard. And if you don't play it for a while, and yeah, you pick and it back up. Yep. Absolutely. Sometimes you choose the wrong one, and then something comes out, and you're like, "Oh, if I would have chosen the other one, things would have changed differently." Type of deal, yep. you know? Like I should have thought that that was coming, yep. and type of deals like that. Th- there's a reason when there's a reason I only have four decks in my my lineup essentially because I only play two or three games a week, and one deck usually doesn't get played every week. And if I have six decks. Well, now half of them aren't getting played, and you forget how you forget all the sequencing and what's in them, and yep, it makes me feel like I'm a, getting worse as a player. Sure, I I have actively have nine or ten decks right now that are put together that I actively play, but I've started going okay tonight. I'm only going to play these four decks because I don't because I want to like and, and and I usually do that for like two or three weeks in a row, and then I do a switch and because I want to because if you don't if if you are scatter shotting. 10 different decks in 10 different games you you cannot play you just can't do it at least my brain can't maybe someone else can but i can't maintain maximum efficiency on decks until i've got three or four games to kind of get the feeling back um so that's yeah, what I i'm doing. the same way um chris what do you got okay this might not be a play mistake in your guys eyes but i think it is because it has actually won me a lot of games ignoring the weakest player on the field <laughs> the player who's mana hosed isn't doing nothing. I believe that you should never ignore that player, particularly if the player with the weakest board state is someone who you know to be a good player with a good, <laughs> with a good deck. I will f- fully admit there's there's been games recently, like as, but since Christmas at least, where I've sat there going, they shouldn't be ignoring me with this deck. I have no board state. I'm not doing great. These guys are someone's making a mis- these guys are making a mistake right now. They should not let me alone for the next three turns. Yeah. And they're going to, and they do. Yep. And then, and I've won that game from that bad position to start with. Like he, I, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's pretty much all you have to do is just sit back and bide your time when you're the lowest man on the totem pole. If people ignore you, mm-hmm. just like okay, they're all nuking it out. Okay, they're all at ten life, and everyone's tapped out. Oh, I'll wrath the board and play this haste guy and this haste guy and kill those two guys. Yep. And now, <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely also when I'm in that position where I'm like, I just haven't hit much, but I absolutely act like my situation is worse than it is. You up the political game and I hardcore, do a, and I do, <laughs> or I, and I do like a ugh, when I draw the card, I draw my card, even if it's not bad. <laughs> like I absolutely do that. You you actually called me out on it about a month ago because I was sitting there playing Dramolka and I'm just playing my lands, playing my lands, playing Mana Rock. And Dana's like, it's like turn six. I played a couple of rounds. So he goes, you have 12 mana on like turn seven. And he's not playing anything. And you're not playing anything. Like you could have casted Dramolka twice now. Like how many board wipes do you have in your hand? And I'm like three. <laughs> And you did. You and, I think yeah. you, I'm pretty sure you won that game. Yeah, and then because I had Hall of the Bandit Lord already on the field, so I was just biding time. I'm like I have a haste enabler. I can just let everybody and, kill each other, and then I'll go in yeah. and clean up the mess. But you can't do anything about it either because I wasn't playing. A, I didn't. I didn't have blue, so I wasn't playing yeah. counterplay. So, so then I, after I realized it, I, I started pulling back. But it was too late. He had because you. I think you played Dramoka, and then you played either Rishkar's Expertise or. Yep. Or souls, whatever. And then drew like, you know, eight cards. And then, and he then Dramoka somebody died. And, 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 right. <laughs> and came back. And came back <laughs> a bunch of times. And he was up to like 60 life and had like a full grip. And it was not not good. When you can Wrath of God and cast your commander for the third time in the game and have mana to spare, there's a problem. And still a fistful of cards. Yeah. No, that got out of control. Yeah, I know. Um, I've seen it in a lot of games, you know, with like people that I don't know very well. You know, you attack that person. They're like, oh, I'm only on two lands. Why are you attacking me? I'm not doing anything in this game. And. You feel bad for the player, you know, because they're not really getting able to play. But honestly, I would say the best thing to say to them is just, look, okay, you're at 40 life. I'm at like 20 life. If you do anything that turns the table, there's no way I can recover Catch to come. Up. Right. Yeah. And you also want to like, you don't just turn on that person and ignore no. the threats, but you don't just ignore them either. You make sure you, yeah. if you've got a, you know, that 7-7 seven, seven and a 6-6 six, six and the 2-2, two, two, well, you throw that 2-2 two, two at them yep. and hit the other threats with the big beaters, but you don't let them do nothing. I 100% agree with that. Mm-hmm. 
Um, all right, so for my next one here, and this is going to be a little bit more um, kind of general, but I would say it's not thinking about the downstream choices, the downstream things from the choices you make, meaning talking like kind of like butterfly effect, like if I'm doing this thing, what else is it going to be doing? So if I, oh, hey, this creature's coming at me, I'm going to path to exile it. Kill the kill it and give the you know they'll, so what they'll gain seven life who cares, I've th- this was one that I saw recently with the path of exile there was a scourge of the thrones in the f- on the on the field and scourge okay. of the thrones if you have the throne meaning if you're attacking the highest life total the highest life total you get an extra attack phase yep and that the person did not have dethrone until the swords of the plowshares came out oh really and it gave somebody enough life to then turn on scourge of the throne which had a sort of the animus on it so then the person was able to get the second attack phase and get two life or get two lands off the attack and it wound up being it didn't i don't know if it won the game but it radically shifted things right just to not take like it, it wasn't a lot it was five or six damage from the person who's at like 32 so they'd have gone down to like 25 it wasn't a big deal but they didn't take it. They sorted something that didn't need to be sorted, which at, at, isn't a big de- Like You're just like, okay, well, that was a play mistake. Who cares? You shouldn't have done it, but whatever. Except for it cascaded because I didn't look at the other things that it affected. And as soon as it happened, I was like, oh, that's going to affect that dragon. That's not good. Right. And then it, and it did. It, like Bad things happened as a result of that. And that's if you're a new player, it's tough to like look at that kind of thing. When you see a 5-5 five, five flyer coming at your face... Or at someone else and you want to save them, yeah, you do the cool thing and help them. And Which is also like a subcategory, I would say, is people are afraid to take damage when they should be a little bit more willing to take it sometimes. But it's Bilkin from the master himself. <laughs> who's probably too careless. I probably admittedly sometimes am too careless with how much damage I take. Um, but <laughs> That's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> um, or how many cards I get milled in my recce deck. Um, <laughs> But it, it, that was definitely one that I remember thinking, like, you need to look at the next level because it's not just destroy this creature, exile this creature. It's what is that going to do to the rest of the game? Yep. So. I actually have that on my list as not paying t- attention to the game itself. Sure. Uh, right. Yep. Yep. My next one is learning to mulligan. Oh, that's a good one. <sighs> Even pros have not mastered that art yet. <laughs> For right. sure. But it kind of goes to the point of, making sure you're not the low man on the totem pole, if you kept a hand with two lands, why? <laughs> like, Right. What else was in there that made you think, okay, I'm going to get there, I'm going to get that third land and be ready to rock and roll if you don't have any mana rocks or anything? I think it also goes and hand in hand. And you're playing Dragon Tribal, so your average CMC is six. I mean, like, maybe that two lands is fine if you're playing Elf Ball or something. Um, right. But it's not, <laughs> most of the time it's not fine. Or... In, like, my Brago deck, I only run 34 lands, but I have a dozen mana rocks. So two lands, knowing my next two or three draws is going to be a mana rock, statistically. Or a land. Or a land. It'll get you there. Which I'm going to get there. Which yep. then opens up that mana rock that you can play, which then opens up another, I mean, like. Right. And, I mean, it all goes hand-to-hand with knowing your deck. Right. Sure. For sure. I like that one. Because I'm bad at that. Like, I, I don't f- screw up. I don't feel like I keep bad hands a lot, but I oftentimes keep a hand and I'm like, oh, do I want to? I think I'm okay. I don't know, though. So I'm like, I'm, I'm always, particularly if I'm playing limited or something, I'm I'm really unsure then if I'm playing in a oh, that's 60 card or 40 me. card format. When it, when it comes to Commander, especially when I sit down and play with you guys, if my opening hand has four lands in it and nothing else to do, I don't even care. I'm just like, sure, we'll keep this. I would, right. I would absolutely rather keep too much land than yeah. not enough. Now, sure. if I sit down with players I don't know, I will aggressively mulligan into a hand that I'm going to be very proactive in the game itself. Sure. D- does how you mulligan change where you are in turn order? Like if you're player one, do you mulligan harder than if you're player four to see what everybody else plays on turn I've one? I've never really two? thought about it that way in commander. Because I know in limited or like in competitive, it's only you and me. So if you're on the play, you mulligan different than you do when yep. you're on the draw. Sure. So maybe that type of, uh, thinking of f- should go into commander with okay I'm ter- I'm player three, I have two players coming before me maybe I can keep this two or three land hand. Yeah, see the thing with commander though too with the rules that we follow with the uh, Vancouver Mulligan. Yep. Um and a free Mulligan, uh 
is that you get to draw immediately on your first turn. Right. right. Whereas in a limited format or whatever other format, you don't, you don't get to draw on your first turn. So you should be able to aggressive more aggress- uh, mulligan more aggressively than any other format because right. you get that extra card draw right away. Because if you mulligan down to five, you get a scry. And you get the card. So if you want to keep it, you know you're drawing it right away. Yep. Or you put it on the bottom, play the mystery box game. Yep. Right. I'd also say this is an, also an extension of at least part of this is knowing your deck. There are some decks that you you may be like, oh, I can keep two talking about Elf Ball, but also your Brago deck. You said you know your deck, so you're more comfortable keeping a leaner hand. Mm-hmm. My Edric deck, I'm more comfortable keeping a little bit leaner hand because my CMC is so low. Or my Glissa deck, whereas in my Sphinx deck, I absolutely better have three opening, three hands on opening hand, if not four, or or a land tax of some or sort. something, or yep. I'm gonna it's gonna be a long game. Um, so that's also part of that as well, because it's different. You can't just have a blind. I'm gonna mull if I don't have X amount of lands. It you need to you need to understand how it changes based on what you're playing, that kind of thing. Chris, how about you? Um. One, I don't know if I'm going to consider this a play mistake or not, but actually, because this goes back to what Max did to you that one game, but not actually playing anything on your turn, but sitting back and watching your opponents, I think it is a mistake in Commander. You need to aggre- uh, progress the board. Sure. You can't just sit back and, you know, oh, I'm going to draw like 30 cards and do nothing. Well, and like draw an, like another 30 cards and do nothing type well, deal. Well, that like, makes you a target. Sure. <laughs> well, <laughs> that too. But I mean, if <laughs> but, you're not progressing the board, you're not actually going to win. But like in Max's case, he, was, he wasn't he was just like draw go. He was draw, play land, sigh. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> really hard sigh. I guess I'll, I mean, I'm just going to nature's lore for a land and, and put it into play and pass turn and then come back around and. Draw one. I'm like, oh man, I guess rampant growth and pass. Growth, <laughs> like, so right, he was doing that. He was yep. like advancing the board state without looking like he was advancing the board advancing state. Advancing the board state, right? Yeah, but I see that with a lot of players though, where they just they play a land pass. They're yep. not actually putting anything into the board. Maybe they're worried it's going to get destroyed or something. That's going to happen in the game. There's nothing you can do to avoid it. But you need to start putting that stuff out there because if it doesn't. It starts giving you a little bit more advantage, a little bit more advantage until you can finally build up to what you need to do. Exactly. It, it, actually, in some time, I don't do it all the time, but there are plenty of times I also, even if I have nothing to play on that turn two or that turn three or something, I will actually do like a start to tap my lands and pause and go, no, I'm fine, pass and go. Mm-hmm. Like, even that is a thing. You're like, even if you have nothing to do, like maybe bluffing a little bit like you do. I don't know if that does anything or not, but. There's no downside to acting like you maybe have something, really. Right. No, that's all. It's all because it turns into the mental game of magic, then. Yeah, for yep. sure. Um, I have one other one that's this is going to might maybe get a little bit long because I'm going to talk <laughs> about something else. <laughs> so, this is going to be not correctly evaluating um, decisions you make. And so, I'm going to subsection this by talking about something called Pascal's Wager. Are you guys familiar with Pascal's Wager and all? I am not. All right. This isn't the guy with the cat, is it? It is not. That's okay. Schrodinger's that's Schrodinger. Cat. That's, the, that's the guy from Peanuts. Okay. So I'm probably going to freak out some say some philosophy major because I'm going to explain this really in layman's terms. But what Pascal's Wager is, is he was a mathematician hundreds of years ago. And just kind of as a thought experiment, he did like a, a mathematical kind of breakdown of should you believe in God or not based on kind of the game theory. So <laughs> we go from politics to religion, <laughs> right. everybody. Right. Um, so, so what his so how, here's how I explained it. You can choose either to believe in God or not believe in God, and those, those are your two options. So, so let's look at each one. Say you choose to not believe in God, you can either be right or wrong. So if you are correct, you've decided there's no God and there is no God. So what's your you know upside and downside? Well, you've got to enjoy sinning. Assuming that's somewhat fun. Some sin is fun. So you've got to sin and had no consequence. That's probably good. Um, what if you're wrong? What if you decided to not believe in God and there is one? So that's the other outcome. Well, you got to enjoy some sin, but then you presumably would go to hell based on most religions. Yep. So that's your downside. Looking at it in the other direction, your choice is to believe in God. And if you're wrong, uh, I believe in God and there isn't one. Well, you messed out on some sin. And that's really where it ends. You die, and that's the end. If you're correct, the upside is you would go to heaven, or whatever the version of that is in your religion, which is supposedly the best thing ever. So looking at your two choices, 
the not believing in God has not, the upside's relatively low, enjoying sin, downside's huge, you're going to hell, versus believing in God where your upside is going to heaven and your downside is missing out on a few things. Yep. So based on the kind of the math of those choices, believing God's a correct choice. Huge upside, no downside, versus huge downside with no upside. So <laughs> where I'm going with this, because I love Pascal's wager for like decision making. Yep. And you can look at most things and like, what are my decisions here? What are my choices? What are the upsides versus the downsides? And we'll go back to the example from before from mystic confluence versus evacuation. Okay, well, mystic confluence, your upside is you have to draw two cards off the other two modes and bounce my creature. But if you're wrong and I have that heroic intervention, you lose the game. Yep. Versus casting the evacuation where if I, if I don't have anything, well, you miss out on two cards, but you've guaranteed you're not going to lose with the evacuation. So it has, you know, smaller upside, but the downside is awful if, with that mystic confluence because you just lost. Versus evacuation where you miss a little bit of upside, but if you're correct, you don't lose the game. So I think people, I, I don't think you need to like get out a notepad, write down like a decision making tree. What are the upsides? <laughs> and flow chart again, and right? Flow you don't chart. need a flow chart, but like you also probably need to understand, based on this choice, is it worth the risk? Is the small upside worth the downside, and vice versa? In a life in general, I kind of look at decisions like that, but in magic, you can kind of ballpark it in a few seconds and decide is it worth this risk? Yeah. So. That's that's one I see as well. People not understanding the risk versus reward of the things they do. I think that also falls back into people not knowing card pools. Oh yeah, yeah. like a lot of people don't know, you know, thirty thousand cards. Like I'm not a a can't. library of cards. I can tell you what cards do. Uh, there's no way that I can give you the name of that card. I'll tell you what it is and be like, let's Google this and see what the name is, type of deal. There's a lot of cards we don't know. And we still know more cards than 90% of players I encounter. Probably. If not more than that. Yep. And there's still a lot of stuff we don't know. Well, there's every now and then there's I still see a card that comes into play and I'm like, what? Yeah, for, yeah exactly. <laughs> that I, it can segue into my next one, actually. This is perfect. All right. Reading cards. Like, if you're a new player or if you come across a card you don't know what it does, ask. Raise your hand and say, hey, can I read that? I had this instance on Modern Monday, the whole entire game. I played uh, Scred Red for Modern this mm -hmm. Monday, um, playing against a Jeskai control list. And every time I played a card, he had no clue what it was. Like scrying sheets. He's like, what is that? Show him. <laughs> right. Mouth of Ronum. What is that? Okay, I'll show you. Played Scred. What does that do? Okay, I'll show you. So at that point, I started just playing my cards facing him. So he <laughs> yeah. could just read them as I played them. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, that no, was a perfect segue for my Yes, yeah, no, I was done. So, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, because even if you know stuff, I always forget, okay, Blood Artist. When that, I always confuse the Blood Artist effect, which is when a creature dies... Um, you gain one, target player target loses one. Target player yep. loses one. And I always for confuse that with extort. I can never remember if it's target player or if it's extort yep. effect, where all players lose one and you gain... A life for each law. Is it? Do you gain one or do you gain? Again, see, I'm forgetting right now. Extort. Everybody loses one. You gain that many. So you gain three if in a four-player game. Yep. Um, Blood artist is you gain one. Target opponent loses one. Zulaport cutthroat is only on your creatures. Zulaport is whenever another creature you control dies, each opponent loses one life, and you only gain one. Yep. So you don't gain the three or yep. two or whatever. And those are so those are all three slightly different effects. And you see those cards a lot in Commander, and I always have to, like, which is which again? Yep. So absolutely ask, even if you're if you're a new player for sure, but if veteran players, you don't, you forget. Yeah. There's just too much stuff. Um, actually, Bajuka Bog, I've started kind of forgetting because Scavenger Grounds exiles all graveyards, and I still kind of have to, when someone plays a Bajuka Bog, I have to go, I have to pause and go, oh, that's just target player, not all yep. graveyards. Mm-hmm. It's like a card that once upon a time I never would have doubted. Now, because of Scavenger Grounds, I kind of now kind of forget almost how it works. Yeah, no, absolutely. Any other ones we want to talk about? There's a gazillion of them. We could like have this. This could be a four-hour podcast. <laughs> it very well could be. I could discuss my own play mistakes for <laughs> three hours if I wanted to. Absolutely. <laughs> um, the only other one that I have on the list, and I was going to just kind of skip over this one, but was countering the wrong card. 
if you're a blue mage, pick your poison. Pick it right. Don't pick the wrong one because this is a huge one of the biggest play mistakes I see blue mages make. Well, in that's I think also an uh, an element of playing it like it's one v one. In one v one, you can counter everything roughly that your opponent does in certain situations, or you can at least counter counter a lot of things. You cannot in commander counter everything. No, you just no. can't. You'll never keep up. So you you kind of as a control player in blue, you kind of have to change your mindset from I'm going to control this entire game to I'm going to control the things that I need to control and let some other things happen. I think that also is a variable idea because if if us three are sitting down to a game and we're all playing our best decks, I know that you know I need to watch out for Cathar's Crusade in. Chris is a Lesha deck. Mm-hmm. I need to hold a counter spell for that. I need to hold a counter spell for uh, Genesis Wave in Recce or something sure. something big like that. But if you're sitting, if you walk into a shop you've never been to before, or playing with your friend and three other players you've never met before, oh, someone just played a big big bad creature. Okay, I'm going to counter that, and then next turn, player three just played a doubling season. Well. You've never, you don't know what de- player three plays. You don't know what you should be looking for. Right. So I mean, I get your theory and I agree with it, but it's it's situational. I think. If you ever play with a Gave deck, counter everything that they do. Forget the <laughs> other counter, players. Counter I'd bring a lighter and just. <laughs> 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 well, I, I I think of things like if you have the ability to counter uh, a Tarmogoyf in Modern. There's a lot of situations you don't want that hitting the field as a six six or five five or whatever yep. disgusting thing it's going to be. Um, so like. I don't does does negate see much modern play? I think probably, probably a little bit, but I don't think it sees much. Not much because you have your dispel, spell pierce, pack, so spell first of all, snare. Those, first of all, those small counters are much more yep. efficient. But you also have scary creatures that you don't want to have hit the field. Yes, like in commander, I don't run a lot of counter spells, but I'm perfectly fine with negate because in most of my decks, I'm like I don't the scariest creature. I'm probably going to find a way to deal with. I don't want to counter. Your, I don't care if I can't counter your creature spell. For the most part, there's some things yeah. that are obviously terrible, but like for the most part, negate deals with things I need to deal with because the, there are things that are scarier to me than for a the, creature. For it, the most part, for me, if I were to play counter spells, I'm not a blue mage at all, so I don't really ever play them. But I usually save the counter spells to save my stuff. Absolutely, yes. That's I. I do the same thing. Like the, I, I could care less if you're playing, you know. 12 12 galta or whatever cool beans the moment you target something on mine it's getting countered yep yep i definitely agree with that i will use my path to exile on your galta yes <laughs> so you can get that land right not the 12 life right and i'm saving my counter spell for your board wipe that's going to destroy my board presence yep. or your bribery that's going to snag my scary creature or whatever uh yeah no you're i i play it the same way yeah, I had to bring up Galta because I got smacked in the face by you? <laughs> Standard last night Uh-oh. or Wednesday night. Yeah, last night. So nice. I'm, that's yeah. cool that you see him play in, in Standard. No, it wasn't. Cool. I don't want to see it in play. <laughs> when I'm playing blue white ores and my guys are maybe three threes and he's just like Galta on turn four and I'm like, <laughs> ouch, that's brutal. Well, you just splash green then and just put one in the board and drop Galta. No. I, well, I, I want a path to exile or swords of plowshares and standard right now. That's what I need. I've got I've played Galta I think four times now on my recce deck, and every time it's felt like cheating. <laughs> like oh, every time it's, it's felt so it's good. It's such a good card. Ugh. Um, any any other ones we want to quick touch on here before we wrap it up? That's all I can think of off the top of my head. That is my entire list. Okay, all right. There are a lot more, but these are the big ones. We, like, we tried to focus on the ones we've seen in games recently. Or do ourselves. Or do ourselves a lot. There's a lot of ones out there. Send us your play mistakes. We'd like to hear what you think are big ones you guys see. I actually do have one more. Oh, one more. All right. Oh. All right. Ooh. Remember the modifications you make to your deck. <laughs> oh, sure. Because I have done this countless times where I uh, like go to tutor something, and I sit there and dig, and I check my graveyard, and all of a sudden I go... That's right. I took out for this card, and I show him the new card, and <laughs> that does you no I, good. I lose the game. That's good to know. I might have done that a few times myself. <laughs> I think I have as well. Played demonic tutor, vampire tutor. Is like, oh, vampire tutor. You know, instant speed. I can go for this, and you do it, and you're going through your deck. You're like, oh, no, oh, bummer. <laughs> that, that's in the mail because I just traded it to the guy out in California. Yeah. For sure. Okay, so before we wrap it up here, why don't we quick touch on some of the news we had this week? Because we had a big flurry of announcements about product coming out this year. 
we did. So yesterday, uh, February 14th, Valentine's Day, uh, we got a bunch of announcements uh, through the mothership. So the first one is being that in coming in 2018, Magic the Gathering is getting its own app for your yes. phones. Like, all right, well. About I, time, I yeah, guess. Yeah, it was like, kind of, and it was kind of vague it, about. What's it, yeah, I was going to say, what's it going to be about? Uh, it's got a life counter. Life counter and a companion app. So organize your home tournaments and invite pr- friends to play with them. So it's like Facebook for Probably Magic. some social media stuff and some card oh, look God, up. it's going to turn into Reddit it all over again. It has a card lookup function, a news hub. So it's Gather and like Daily MTG plus like. Command Zone's life counter app probably all put yeah, into one. So we'll see what it looks like. I mean, I is still it prefer. Free? Is there free or is there a cost on it? I It doesn't say. I'm not going to read the full announcement. I'm just reading the little bullet point all on right. my computer right now. The next one is uh, a new product line called Signature Spellbook. And the first one being Jace. Of um, course it's Jace. Well, that, and, but that's essentially replacing From the Vault. Yes. Oh, it is? Yes. It is the spiritual successor to From the Vault series. Yeah, Trick Jarrett wrote something on Twitter, I think, that, that From the Vault, for the moment, is on hold. And this is going to be the attempted replacement for it. Um, they're going to MSRP for nineteen ninety nine. Um, Is so it once a 20 year? 20 bucks cheaper? 15. 15 cheaper, but it's less cards, too. Yeah, it's only 10 it's cards. It's only 10 cards. Okay. Um, and one... It will contain one premium foil card and eight cards with the Planeswalker identity. So the first one being Jace, you'll probably get some form of, of Jace Planeswalker card and eight other cards that reference Jace. And presumably it won't be like Jace's Ingenuity, Jace's Erasure. It would be like Counterspell with new Jace art, I'm guessing. Okay. Jace's think, Defeat. Yeah. So we won't just get like bad cards that have Jace's name in the title. We'll get, I'll just think, new art referencing Jace, four old cards, I'm guessing. Okay. Is that just once a year, or is that going to be like multiple? Um, Cause I, I would be fi- I, would, I would be finer with that replaced from the vault if we were going to get one quarterly or something. It does not okay. specify. It just says each signature spellbook will contain a premium foil card and eight other cards. They'll have an MSRP of nineteen ninety nine, and you can get your hands on them starting June fifteenth. All right, I'll probably buy one and leave a seal, just like I the pro- rest of my from the vault. <laughs> probably will too. The next announcement was Battle Bond. It is a new limited set focused on two-headed giant play. Well, it's a two-headed oh, giant oh, oh, oh. conspiracy-ish kind yep. of slot thing. That's cool. I was I was that will be that. cool. That will be releasing June eighth of it's this on a, year. It's on a whole new plane that is f- focused. The plane itself, everyone's focus is on like competition, like sports and stuff. So I'd imagine we'll get groups or guilds kind of that have a particular. Sp- Semi sport kind of theme, and oh, that, that that's cool. I like to it a giant that should be fun. In Battle yeah. Bond, we're going to Kylem, a never before seen okay. plane in the multiverse. Uh, beans flock from all over to the arena of Valor's Reach, where two on two combat is the pinnacle of sport. Hmm. So that that'll be cool. Some and that should uh, presumably being a multiplayer format should have cool new commander cards as well as like mul- reprints. That would be a good place to see reprints of things like. Consoles judgment, yes, that are based around multiplayer. And I would, I would love to see a will of the, was it was a will of the council mechanic? Yeah. Is that yeah. what it was? I would love to see more of that. Yeah, and you could easily do more of it in that yep. too. I mean, for sure. So that would be a great place to see some of those conspiracy mechanics come back. The next announcement, once my computer catches up with me, there we go, uh, is Commander Anthology Volume Two is coming out on June eighth as well. Uh, what June eighth or June eighth? Oh, yeah, for the anthology. The Sorry. anthology. Yes. Um, they have not announced what decks they are yet, but it'll be four again. Uh, so and Mimeoplasm was shown in, in the, some art for it, so it's at least that deck, presumably. Gotcha. So they have another set, though, they can work off of now. They have the four-color commanders right. they can add to it. Yep. So I would be, sh- I would not be surprised to see the Atraxa deck in there. Or Brea. Yeah, but the Atraxa alone is like almost 40, I think. Just for Atraxa. Like, just that card. And I thought I was getting a deal when I got rid of her at, like, 25. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> she paid for the deck when I got rid of mine. Right. Um, and then, Commander 2018 is August 10th. I'm so mad that they're putting those in the summer. I really wish they would be fall, because they really don't do anything in the fall. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there, there is a huge gap between the fall set and, well, the second fall set. I mean, there's... That there's oftentimes nothing from October, November, December. 
until we get the set into January. Yeah, because it almost seems like they're jamming so much product in the summer and then just like falls yeah. off. And because like Commander, you can put okay, this is just gonna be a personal rant, but you can put products in the winter time before Christmas. Mm-hmm. It's the best time to do it. People are looking for gift yep. ideas. You have a family member who's big into the magic, and there's a gift idea right there. The new mm-hmm. product that just came out. Yep. Although I also like. Like the fact that we're going to get it in six months versus nine months. But I mean, <laughs> True. But no, I agree with you. Like yeah. in principle, for um, sure. So there's two things about this. Uh, the little snippet reads: uh, there will be four new decks featuring twelve premium foil commanders. So oh, three so, each. Okay. So three each. Three each. Yep. So and then when you go to the product page, it reads: call on powerful planeswalkers and deploy their signature strategies to make sure you're the last player standing. So this might be foreshadowing. We're getting. Commander planeswalkers, planeswalkers as commanders again. That'd be interesting. I hope that they're new, like canon planeswalkers or new lore planeswalkers that have yes, yeah, characters that we've been hearing about that we have not seen in a card or or, something. or even planeswalkers that were before that could be okay as a commander that wouldn't actually break. But we all know wizards and they'd probably right. do th- something wrong with that. Well, last year they kind of tied in the commander product with Ixalan um, with the tribes. tribes. And we're going to Dominaria, and then we have the Dominaria, the the core set in the summer, which is supposedly Dominaria themed as well. So I wonder if we wouldn't get some Dominaria Planeswalkers, maybe to kind of tie it with that. That would um, be really cool. Yeah, uh, that that's that's awesome. The last announcement was a Chinese specific product, Planeswalker decks. So like the plane, like the Planeswalker decks that we're getting, you know, Jace versus whatever. Yep. There's a Chinese-specific one with two new planeswalkers who I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce their yeah, names. I don't even, I didn't read much on this, so. But there will be English versions of them available. Yes. Ooh. I almost want to go for the Chinese versions because they'll be worth more money. Like the Jason Chandra deck. Yep. Yeah. Those those are also helped because they have different art. Yep. But, yeah, I'll be curious to see how that, and supposedly these are not, however, I believe someone said, um, they're not going to be like the Planeswalker decks where the Planeswalkers are intentionally bad for standard. These are not going to be toned down. They're just going to be regular pl- good Planeswalkers. So they'll be like an event deck almost. Yeah. That power level maybe. So that's cool. More, Very cool. More new characters. I'm always awesome for that. All right. That's everything I got for news. All right. Well, I think that's going to be it for us this week. Sounds good. All right. We will be back next week. Until then, I'm Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Chris. <laughs>